Welcome to the Deep Dive. We're the show that helps you cut through the noise, uh, get straight to what really matters on complex topics. And today, we're definitely diving into something complex. Yeah, something generating a lot of buzz and, frankly, a lot of concern, too. We're talking about the plant kratom. Well, more specifically, a really potent compound from kratom. Exactly. 7-hydroxymetragenine, often just called 7-OH. Right. And this stuff, it really sits at a fascinating crossroads. You've got traditional use, serious public health questions, and some pretty cutting-edge science all converging. Absolutely. So in this deep dive, we're going to unpack 7-OH. It's what's called a terpenoid indole alkaloid, found in the metragnin speciosa plant kratom, basically. We'll look at its uh, surprising strength, how it messes with brain chemistry, the very real risks of addiction and side effects. We'll share some firsthand accounts, too, but then mm. we'll also pivot, look at the science, trying to figure out if there's therapeutic potential here, maybe without the downsides. Yeah, and our sources for this are pretty wide-ranging. We've got scientific papers, pharma data, marketing stuff, mm. even raw online forum discussions from people who've actually used 7-OH. Plus the latest from regulators like the FDA. Right. The goal here is to pull out the key pieces of information, the important insights from all that material. Give you a shortcut, really, to understanding this really fascinating but also quite controversial compound. Okay. All right, let's unpack this. So first things first, what is 7-hydroxymetragenine, the 7-OH, the basics, and, you know, why is it so powerful? Okay, so 7-OH, it's a natural alkaloid. It's in the kratom plant, Metragena speciosa. Mm -hmm. Scientists first properly described it back in 1994. Yeah. But here's where it gets really interesting. In us, in humans, 7-OH isn't something you primarily get just by, you know, chewing the leaf in large amounts. It's mainly produced inside your body. Inside? How does that work? It's an active metabolite. Okay. Metragenine, which is the main active alkaloid in kratom, gets processed by your liver. Hepatic oxidation, technically. Special enzymes transform it into 7-OH. Ah, okay. So your liver actually creates this more potent version. Exactly. And when we say potent, well, the data suggests it's about 13 times more powerful than morphine in how it interacts with certain brain receptors. 13 times. Wow. Yeah. And it binds much more strongly to the main opioid receptors, the eucopioid receptors, than metragenine itself does. So it's not just another minor compound. It's like a supercharged version activated by your own body. It hits hard. That explains a lot. And the way it works in the brain is pharmacology. You said it's unique. It is quite unique, yeah. Think of your opioid receptors like um, different buttons on a control panel. Right. 7-OH pushes hard on the opioid receptor. That's the main one for pain relief, euphoria, also addiction risk. The feel-good button, essentially. Okay, like morphine or other opioids would. Right. But here's the twist. It also seems to block other opioid receptors, the delta and kappa receptors, and those are involved in other things like mood, stress, maybe even some negative effects. So it's pressing one button while blocking others. That gives it a very mixed profile. Which is different from, say, heroin or fentanyl. Very different from traditional opiates and opioids in that regard. Yeah. And there's another key distinction, something scientists are really interested in. What's that? It doesn't seem to activate something called the arrestin pathway, or at least not strongly. Beta arrestin. Whoa. Why does that matter? Well, that pathway is heavily implicated in some of the most dangerous side effects of conventional opioids. Things like severe respiratory depression, stopping breathing, and also tolerance development. Ah, uh, I see. So 7-OH might offer some opioid effects without triggering that specific dangerous pathway as much. That's the theory, or part of the hope driving some research. It absolutely still carries serious risks, don't get me wrong, but this different mechanism, it definitely makes scientists curious about potential therapeutic angles, maybe developing safer alternatives down the line. Makes sense. Now, you mentioned it's in the plant, but also produced by the liver. What about the amount actually in the leaves themselves? That's crucial. In natural, unprocessed kratom leaves, 7-OH is usually only there in really tiny amounts, trace amounts like 0.6 to 0.7% on average, sometimes even less. So very little. Very little, which means just extracting it directly from leaves to get a high concentration isn't really practical. You need enormous amounts of plant material. Okay, so when we see these concentrated 7-OH products being sold, gummies, tablets, shots, where do they come from? They're not just super concentrated leaf extract. No, generally not. Those products are typically made semi-synthetically. Take it synthetically. Yeah. They usually start with metragenine, which is abundant in the leaves, and then they chemically oxidize it outside the body to convert it into 7-OH. Oh, okay. So they're manufacturing the potency, essentially. Exactly. They're creating these highly concentrated forms through 
like chemical process. Mm. And that's how you get these potent products that are causing so much concern now. Right. Which leads us directly to the alarming side of this. We've established its power, but the real worry is the potential for dependence, for addiction. And the reality seems pretty stark based on user reports. It's incredibly stark. I mean, the clinical data itself points to high dependence and addiction liability. <laughs> but honestly, reading the firsthand accounts shared online, it really hits home. What are people saying? Well, initially, users often describe it feeling uh, quite good. Some say like taking a few hydrocodone or Percocets. They mention that itchy, warm euphoria that's characteristic of some opioids. But that doesn't last, I imagine. No. Not at all. A common theme is tolerance building incredibly fast. One user said, so fast. Needed to double their dose within weeks. Weeks. Wow. Yeah. And needing more every single time just to feel anything or just to avoid feeling bad. And the cravings, people describe them as unreal. One person said, unlike anything else I ever felt. That sounds terrifying. And what about stopping the withdrawal? People describe it as just Awful. They explicitly say full-on opiate withdrawals. Mm -hmm. Things like intense physical discomfort, that classic monkey-on-your-back feeling, horrible restlessness, like ants under the skin, twitching, just constant inescapable discomfort. It's brutal. Absolutely. Some accounts mention needing serious help to get off it, like going to rehab or needing medication-assisted treatment like Suboxone. It's not a mild thing for many people. And beyond withdrawal, are there other side effects people report during use? Yes. Definitely. Things like nausea, feeling dizzy, bad cramps, sometimes respiratory depression, which is always a major worry with opioid-like substances. People also mention feeling hungover, intense anxiety, heart palpitations. And there was a particularly concerning interaction mentioned. Yes, tragically. One account highlighted the potential risk of serotonin syndrome if 7-OH is combined with SSRI antidepressants. This person recounted a family member's death believed to be linked to this combination. It's a serious warning. That's awful. And does the science back up these kinds of experiences with dependence? Unfortunately, yes. Annal studies show 7-OH causes physical dependence similar to morphine. They even found cross-tolerance, meaning tolerance to one drug carried over to the other. So the body treats them similarly in that respect. It seems so. And when they gave the animals naloxone, that's the opioid reversal drug, it triggered withdrawal signs just as strongly in mice treated with 7-OH as in those treated with morphine. And what about the addiction potential itself, the rewarding feeling? Roten studies confirm that too. They show what's called condition place preference. The animals learn to prefer the place where they receive the drug. They'll also self-administer it, meaning they'll work to get more. And it causes hyperlocomotion, that increased movement often linked to stimulant or rewarding effects. So the animal models line up pretty well with the human experiences of addiction and withdrawal? They do, and if you zoom out, Look at studies on regular Kratom users, which means exposure to metragenine and the 7-OH produced from it, dependence issues, are reported in over half of them. Withdrawal symptoms are widely documented. It's a significant problem. And adding fuel to the fire is how easy the stuff is to get, right? These concentrated products. That's a huge part of the concern. These potent 7-OH products, they're apparently readily available. Online, smoke shops, gas stations, corner stores, often just sold to anyone 21 and over. So you have this very potent, potentially highly addictive substance with documented withdrawal issues available almost like candy in some places. What does that mean for public health? It means a potentially dangerous situation. Yeah. And it's this combination, the potency, the risks, the accessibility that has really caught the eye of regulators. Right. So how are authorities responding? What's the legal status? Well, currently in the United States, 7-OH itself is technically unscheduled at the federal level, though some states might have their own rules about Kratom generally. Interestingly, it is prohibited in Brazil. But the FDA has taken action recently. Yes, very recently, yeah. July 15th, 2025. The FDA issued warning letters to seven different companies. For what specifically? For illegally marketing products containing 7-OH, specifically the concentrated stuff we've been talking about, tablets, gummies, drink mixes, shots products made with or enhanced to contain high levels of 7-OH. And what's the FDA's reasoning? Why are these illegal? Their stance is quite clear. First, 7-OH is not a lawful dietary supplement ingredient. It's also not approved as a food additive. And critically, it's not an active ingredient in any FDA-approved drug. So it doesn't fit into any legal category for consumption? Pretty much. Therefore, marketing it as if it were especially making health claims about it, like relieving pain or anxiety, claims that haven't been proven that makes these products unapproved new drugs under the law. 
and selling unapproved new drugs is illegal. So the FDA is essentially saying these companies are selling untested drugs with unproven claims. Exactly. The FDA explicitly stated that consumers using these 7-OH products are exposing themselves to substances that haven't been proven safe or effective for any purpose. It's a pretty direct warning about potential unknown dangers. Okay, so we have the clear risks, the user experiences, the FDA warnings. It sounds pretty bleak. But you mentioned earlier there's another side to this, a scientific quest. Yes, surprisingly, there is. The very properties of 7-OH, even its problematic ones, have spurred scientists to do some really innovative research. They're trying to see if they can somehow harness the potentially useful aspects without the dangerous baggage. How are they approaching that? Well, remember how we talked about 7-OH being effective in reducing alcohol consumption in mice, but also having that high opioid receptor potency linked to abuse and other side effects? Yeah, the high potency causing the problems. Right. So the big question became, can we tweak the molecule? Can we separate the potential benefit, like reducing alcohol craving, from the serious risks like addiction? Like designing a better version? Essentially, yes. It's a fascinating scientific detective story. Scientists started modifying kratom alkaloids, trying to create new versions or derivatives. Their specific goal was pretty clever. They wanted to increase the molecule's activity at the delta opioid receptor, that's another opioid receptor type, linked more to mood and stress perhaps, while decreasing its activity at the addiction-linked mu opioid receptor. Okay, so shift the activity profile. Less mu, more delta. Why Delta specifically? Because other research suggested that activating the Delta opioid receptor might help reduce things like compulsive drug seeking or alcohol consumption, potentially without the same level of reward or respiratory depression as mu receptor activation. They were aiming for what they call an improved therapeutic window, especially for conditions like alcohol use disorder, AUD. Makes sense. Did they find anything promising? They investigated several compounds. It was a process of elimination, really. Some natural kratom alkaloids, like one called panenthene, showed some promise. It did reduce alcohol intake in mice and seemed less rewarding, maybe even aversive. There's always a but in science. But it wasn't perfect. It only weakly blocked morphine's effects. And at higher doses, it caused some minor seizures, which seemed unrelated to the target receptors. So not ideal. OK, what else? Another one, speciosiliatine, also reduced alcohol intake. But it turned out to be a delta receptor blocker not an activator, and it caused coordination problems. So that was another dead end, pointing towards off-target effects. So the natural compounds weren't quite hitting the mark. Not for this specific goal. It's... But then, and this is where it gets really exciting, they tested a synthesized analog, a molecule they created based on the kratom structure called 7 hydroxy speciogenin. Let's call it 7-OH-SPG. 7-OH-SPG, and this one was different. This one emerged as the clear frontrunner, the most promising lead compound for potentially treating alcohol use. What made it stand out so much? It hit that sweet spot they were looking for. Compared to the original problematic 7-OH, this new 7-OH-SPG had significantly reduced potency at the muopioid receptor, the addiction-linked one. Good start. Less addiction potential, theoretically. Right. But it kept similar potency at the target delta opioid receptor and it powerfully reduced alcohol intake in mice, an effect that seemed partially dependent on that delta receptor activity. So it worked for the intended purpose, but what about side effects? That was the whole point. Exactly. And here's the kicker. At its maximum tolerated dose in these studies, 7-OH-SPG showed a dramatically better side effect profile. Critically, no conditioned place preference suggesting no rewarding or addictive potential. None at all. That's huge. Huge difference. Also, no significant changes in general movement, no hyperlocomotion, and importantly, no seizures. Plus, it didn't seem to cause general pain relief or block morphine's effects, suggesting its actions were much more targeted. Wow. So it seemed to do the job reduce alcohol intake via the delta receptor without the major opioid side effects or addiction signals. That's what the preclinical data strongly suggests. A much cleaner profile. That sounds like a significant breakthrough. What does this mean for the bigger picture, for developing new treatments? Well, it strongly supports the idea that specifically targeting the delta opioid receptor could be a viable strategy for reducing voluntary alcohol consumption. It also shows that kratom alkaloids, despite their own risks, can serve as really valuable starting points, late scaffolds, researchers call them. Blueprints, basically. Exactly. Blueprints for designing more refined drugs. Hmm. In this case, they're aiming for what are called G-protein biased delta opioid receptor agonists. Okay, unpack that slightly. It basically means designing molecules that activate the delta receptor in a very specific way, 
triggering only certain downstream signals, like the G-protein pathway, while avoiding others, like that beta-restin pathway we mentioned earlier, though it's more complex. The goal is to get the therapeutic benefit reducing alcohol craving without activating the pathways that cause unwanted side effects or addiction. Like a key that only turns part of the lock, the good part. That's a great analogy. It's about precision medicine, designing drugs with very specific actions to maximize benefits and minimize harm. And this research shows a potential path forward, inspired by, but hopefully much safer than, 7-OH itself. So wrapping this up today, we've really seen how 7-hydroxymetragenine is, well, a double-edged sword, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. On one hand, it's this potent compound, naturally derived, but often concentrated synthetically, with clear and serious risks for addiction and severe side effects. That's prompted regulatory action like the recent FDA warnings. But on the other hand, its very existence and unique properties have become this crucial stepping stone for scientific research. It's inspired scientists to create and test novel compounds, like that promising 7 hydroxy speciogenin 7-OH-SPG. Yeah, compounds that aim to capture some potential therapeutic benefit, maybe for alcohol use disorder, while carefully designing out the dangers that come with the original 7-OH. It really makes you think, doesn't it? So here's something to consider as we finish. What really stands out to you, listening to this, when you think about that huge difference between a compound found in tiny amounts naturally in a plant versus its concentrated, often semi-synthetic form sold in stores. And also, what about this ongoing scientific effort to take that natural blueprint, refine it, tailor its effects, maybe even create something beneficial for specific medical needs. How does exploring all this maybe reshape your own understanding of what we mean by natural versus safe, particularly when we're talking about substances and how they impact our health and our brains? Something to mull over. Mm.